many different denominations, are going are gonna to cover Romans throughout much of the summer. So uh, we're going to focus on that as we go through uh, the book of Romans. As we discussed last week, this is a, a letter that Paul wrote to Rome, uh, a church he had never been to before. It was, it was the one letter he wrote to someone that he didn't, a church that he didn't start. And so this is kind of a letter where he's introducing himself. Um, to the Romans. And so as a result, we're calling it the Road to Rome um, Bible se- or, or, um, Sermon Series. Um, and Ro- Romans is actually a very challenging book. It's very, very dense. It's very theological. Uh, it goes through in a very methodical way and talks about Christianity. It, if it was a college course, you could call it Christianity 101. And so we're going to see very methodical explanation of Christianity as we go through. Now, the first four chapters, uh, which we skipped over in our lectionary, talked about the law, and it talked about it in a really not a very complimentary way. Um, Basically, it says all that the law can do is it can condemn you. It can't save you. Um, It says that we are sinful. And really, Paul is speaking in terms of the old covenant here, Um, which was based on laws. Uh, The most prominent of those laws were the Ten Commandments, although there were many other laws that he gave in the Old Testament. And it was this old covenant where he says, I will be your God, and you will be my people. Obey my commandments. Now, last week we got into chapter 5, where Paul transitioned from the law of the old covenant and has now introduced the gospel as it was fully revealed in the new covenant. And he spoke about Jesus and how Jesus came to fix what Adam brought. Um, Through one person, Adam, sin came into the world, and as a result, all have sinned. Through one person came Jesus Christ, and uh, and it's through the grace and forgiveness of of Jesus Christ that all are forgiven. And so we have a, um, a, a clear introduction then of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and uh, uh, that this is a free gift uh, which we have not earned. So now we pick up today in chapter 6, and uh, in chapter 6, this raises some, a sticky question about this new covenant. Uh, and that question is, is where does the law fit in? Again, when he spoke about the law of the first four chapters, it was not very glowingly. It, 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 it's not going to help you out very much. Uh, if you want to get to heaven. And so now uh, he brings the gospel, um, and it, it addresses how we are to live our life as Christians. You might remember last week we looked and we closed with this Bible verse about how God's grace overflows for us and that his grace is greater than our sin. Um, he says, now the law came in to increase the sin, That is saying, you know, was there sin before the law? Because the law defines sin. And if there's no law, was there sin? He said, well, yes, there was sin. But he did acknowledge that once the law came into being, that sin increased. Um, The the law actually instigates us to sin more because of our rebellious nature, right? You know, tell someone not to do something, what do they do? (laughs) They do it. Um, And so uh, Paul acknowledges that um, the law can increase sin, but where sin increases Grace increases all the more. Thanks be to God. But that raises a sticky question because one could then argue, which Paul did at the beginning of chapter 6, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? So in other words, if the more I grace, the greater, uh, or the more I sin, the greater grace I receive. Should I sin more? And then I receive more grace? Um, That's the question that Paul is addressing. And And his answer was obviously no. And I'm sure intuitively that you all know that that would be the answer, that we are to live godly lives. But I want to take this a little bit deeper today as as we go through Paul's answer here. Um, You know, there's a little bit more to this than, than that initial answer. To what extent is the law still active in our lives today? You know, to what extent do we hold each other accountable? Um, Many people today, young people, don't like church because they are too judgmental, right? Maybe at times we are 
too judgmental. But maybe other times not. Being judgmental means that we are applying the law to people's lives. It's saying that we have expectations for each other. Now again, Paul in the first four chapters does not speak very glowingly of the law, but he's now going to, in, in this section, begin to address where does the law fit in now that we have the gospel introduced. And this is a very pertinent question today because it, it affects many aspects of our life. And I'll just share one more. Uh, I won't answer it today, but uh, the, ob the obligation, is it an obligation to tithe? Tithing is where we give 10% of our income to church. That was an Old Testament law, not one of the Ten Commandments, but it was an Old Testament law. They were supposed to do it. Uh, under the New Covenant, is, are we supposed to do that? Is that a law that still holds today? Um, and if it is, uh, what should motivate us for our giving? Should it be guilt, which is, again, the law acting in our lives, or should it be through the gospel and the grace of, of response to that? Where does the law fit in today? It sounds like an academic question that you might hear at the seminary, but it's not just an academic question. It's a question that affects each and every one of us in our walk as Christians. So let's jump in. Let's see what Paul has to tell us about the law and where it fits in now that we have the gospel introduced. And uh, to understand this, uh, we have to realize that uh, the new covenant involves a transformation. And, and Paul speaks a little bit about this in the first half of chapter 6, which we did not read. I would like to read a little bit of that. As we uh, look at this first part of, of uh, chapter 6, think about this transformation uh, and the words that are spoken, how they speak of transformation uh, through the gospel. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so there's the, there's the transformation. We're buried, we, we become dead, uh, but through uh, our transformation, we receive life. For we have been united with him in a death like his. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And so again, in this transformation that we go through, we become united with Christ. Verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin uh, might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. And once again, this speaks to our transformation. Uh, we crucify the old self, uh, uh, and sin, the body of sin, has been brought to nothing, and uh, we have been set free. Did any of these words jump out at you? Die to sin. I, I love this cartoon by Mary Chambers. Two couples are seated in the living room in a Bible study. And one woman says, um, well, I haven't actually died to sin, but I did feel kind of faint once. In this new covenant, which Paul is reviewing with the Roman church as he anticipates his visit, he says that you must die to sin. There is a transformation that we must go through. And that transformation comes through our baptism. It is in our baptism that we receive the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that transforms our lives. But yet, these words today are so challenging. We hear these words that Paul says to us, and what's our response? We say, say what? Really? You know, the present circumstances appear to contradict the reality. The body of sin has been brought to nothing. Is that, did that jump out to you? Uh, is my, in my life, is really the body of sin brought to nothing? Well, I don't know about you, but I still sin. And, uh, and so when Paul says this, uh, it might have uh, raised a few questions in your mind. And uh, Paul is actually going to be struggling with this issue uh, the next couple of weeks, especially when we get into chapter 7, uh, about the struggle that we still have with sin. Uh, 
But to try to understand his words today, I, I'm going to share uh, one line here, and I think this will help get us started. Um, and that line is, baptism does not end conflict, but rather it starts it. Again, baptism, and, we can, and I'm using baptism and transformation interchangeably. We could also call this conversion. Uh, baptism or transformation or conversion um, does not end conflict, but rather it starts it. And we can say that because Paul tells us today that before our transformation, what state were we in? He said we were slaves to sin. Okay? There was no conflict before our conversion because sin completely reigned in our life. We were totally a subject to sin. We could not get away from it. There was nothing that we could do on our own to overcome it. In fact, one commentator put it this way. He said, one may as well tell a drowning person simply to swim to shore as to tell a person who is under sin's mastery to let sin not reign in their life. To tell someone not to sin would be the same way of telling someone who's drowning, swim. I mean, they can't do it. We can't do it on our own. And, and so Paul speaks to our pre-conversion uh, as being in bondage to sin, and he used a metaphor to describe this, and that metaphor uh, was the idea of slavery. And so let's go back and review what he told us. He said, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. There's a lot there. Let's see if we can um, uh, crystallize it a little bit. He's saying, but now, after your transformation, you realize that you now have two options. Before, there was only one option. You were a slave to sin. Now you have two options, that he, as he shares here. You can either go back to being a slave to sin, or you can be a slave to to righteousness. You can be obedient. This new covenant works differently. This new covenant gives us the Holy Spirit living within us, and that Holy Spirit gives us a new heart. Let's go back and relook at 17 with some different words highlighted. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient. How? From the heart. God, in this new covenant, changes our heart. And in this sense, the law is no longer needed because the Holy Spirit has worked this change in our heart. That's why in the first four chapters, Paul speaks so negatively of the law because it really can't accomplish anything. It's really the Holy Spirit changing our heart uh, is where we need to be. And so now, under this, the new covenant that Paul is introducing, uh, we no longer need to be guilted into what to do, but rather the Spirit will give us the desire to want to do what is right. So what has ended, then, is sin's unopposed, unchallenged reign in our life. Those now alive to God are able to hear and to respond to either the call of sin, which leads to death, or the call of God, which results in righteousness. So no longer a slave to sin, now we have a choice. Formerly they did not have an alternative, now they do. However, even though we are not slaves to sin, sin still seeks to regain its former dominion in our life, to go from that freedom um, back to that bondage. 
Even as baptized believers, the mortal body still has these sinful desires. And even though sin may not be reigning in our life, sin uh, attempts to regain its reign by getting believers to listen and then to act upon those desires. But Paul reminds us we have died to sin in baptism. He reminds us that we are no longer enslaved to sin. We now have a choice. Follow sin or the living God. And what's great, the good news is he enables us. He gives us the strength. He gives us that ability to do that through the spirit living in us, the spirit that we nurture um, uh, through his sacraments. I hope you're still with me, but this is very confusing. The seminary actually has, um, within the last 10 years, uh, uh, used this diagram to explain this. It's, um, they call it the two kinds of righteousness, but it's, that's, that's a little too theoretical. Uh, the vertical line speaks about our relationship with God, and that speaks about salvation, our righteousness with God, and it is a free gift. That's what Paul has been talking about in chapter 5, uh, a gift given to us. But the law still applies in what we call the horizontal realm. Our gifts, our relationship with God, uh, the righteousness with God um, is a free gift. It's given to us. Uh, we believe and we trust. But now that we have been given that gift, we have uh, what's called the horizontal righteousness, uh, uh, our relationships with each other. And in those relationships with each other, that is where the law still applies. The law does not apply in our relationship with God. It gets us nowhere. But the law does apply in our relationships with each other. And I just reinforce the transformation, this vertical transformation is not our doing. If we look at the verbs that speak about it, they're all passive. All right? And many of you are, are really good in English, right? You know what a passive verb is. Normally, the subject does what the verb says, but that's not the case in a passive. Uh, in, the, in the case of a passive, the subject is the one who receives the action of the verb. So uh, when we were buried, it's not us that buried ourselves, but we were buried by, by someone else. When we have been united, it wasn't us that united us with God. It was rather God uniting us, so it's, it's passive. Uh, we have been set free. It wasn't us who set us free. Rather, we passively received that. It was God that was setting free. And so this, this reinforces that this vertical relationship is not anything we did, uh, but we're, we were passive. It's something that God did to us in our baptism. But now as Lutherans, we, we tend to say, okay, throw the law out because the law gets us nowhere. But no, this, this is where Paul changes it. He says, but once we are baptized and transformed, we now have choices to make. And Paul is actually using an imperatives in the Greek, and imperatives are commands. And commands, we could say, is law. So really the law holds true in our horizontal relationships as we make choices uh, in our everyday walk. Again, uh, the horizontal relationship requires active obedience, the spirit working in our life, but our, our salvation comes from God's grace. As I wrap this up today, um, I, I've got one other line I want to share with you. And if you understand this, I think you'll get to the gist of what this is if you haven't, you know, if you have been lost. Um, being freed from sla the slavery of sin is not the same as free from sinning. Okay, does that make sense? Being freed from the slavery of sin, which we are, is not the same as being free from sinning, which we are not. If you understand that, I think you've got the gist of what Paul is trying to say today. We are no longer slaves to sin. We now have a choice. But that doesn't mean we always make the best choice. We still will struggle with sin, and we'll be talking about that struggle of sin more as we get into chapter 7 over the next couple weeks. But as I apply this to our lives, I just, one brief comment. I, I think that the reason that so many people today reject G Jesus is 
because they want to be slaves to no one. They do not want to give up the sins in their lives. They view religion as slavery. I can't do what I want to do. But what they don't see is their slavery to sin and what it means for their life. Paul is imploring the Romans to be slaves to righteousness. Let the Spirit lead and control your lives because we now have a choice. Follow sin or follow obedience and righteousness. But as we will share in the next few weeks and as we all know intuitively, we still make that wrong choice at times. We stumble. And our good news today is that when we do stumble, we can and we should fall on our knees with humble hearts, repent, and then fully receive his grace and his forgiveness, which is overflowing in our lives. Amen.